Um, so thanks for thanks for coming back. Uh, like I said, 10 minute breaks are never 10 minutes long. Uh, but I have some questions to prime the pump while those of you in the audience are preparing yours and coming up with the microphone and asking questions. But uh, so I've got a question for each speaker, and then we'll move to the audience, and, and I'll fill in as time permits. So you can get get in line because you might not be first if you don't get in line now. <laughs> uh, Bruce, how many people could Space Hub accommodate, and what was the hardest part of bringing it to operational status? Um, well, remember that that there was nobody in Space Hub when it launched, so right. it was just the the crew of of there and it was about the same size the single module is about the same size as the mid deck so if you're really friendly you can get seven people in there but it is cozy yeah. um uh so um you know um so it's just a matter of how you distributed it, it was usually what you were doing that that said how many people were in yeah. there okay and uh so it was just you know what uh, what activities, what experiments you were doing, and, and things like that, and and obviously for some flights there was a lot more activity. There was a lot more, um, you know, uh, astronaut interaction with the right. payloads, and other ones were pretty passive. Sometimes you just go in and flip a switch, and then the thing works, and and then you um, and then you go away. Okay, and the biggest hurdle. Um, you know, it, it's trite, but you know, it was it was raising money, and and. I mean, clearly the, the, the big take the wind out of your sails is we started this, you know, Bob started this in, in 83, we incorporated it in 84, I joined in 85, and then 86 you have Challenger. So the, the vehicle crashes, the program is down, you know, it's ugly. Right. Um, yeah, you that know, was a sad, sad time. It was a very sad time, very traumatic for, for everybody that, that's involved. And then especially when you're trying to, the, the, both the good and the bad thing about Space Hab was you were intimately tied to the space shuttle. Yeah. There's not a real market for you know, mid-deck augmentation modules other than the space shuttle. <laughs> so it wasn't like, well, we'll go fly in another vehicle. You weren't going to fly it on an ELV or something like that, which didn't okay. even exist back then. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, for 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 station, I'm gonna I'm gonna add a little, a little here. For station, I think we should avoid this multi-modular future constructs that require integrated subsystems with external connections. You know, somehow we have to make those connections when we connect the modules or have the modules independent of each other. Based on based on my experience with station. So going back to uh, uh, the panel, Bob, with Northrop Grumman. Sorry, Thomas, I'm sorry. Yes. Avoiding, avoiding modules that need to be interconnected or utilities to span the modules on the external side of the uh, modules. But like with an EVA, when you, yeah. When you, with the EVA. When you bring them together, all the utilities should connect if there are cross connections between the modules when you connect them mechanically. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Bob, uh, what, what do you think is the biggest risk for humanity as we move out beyond LEO? into gateway and, and elements like that. Actually, if you don't mind, first I'll comment on your uh, thing about uh, EVA sure. and external connections. So uh, NASA's put out these interoperability standards okay. that yes. really focus on how do modules connect together, because um, it's their vision that this gateway, sorry about that, it's their vision that um, this gateway is going to become an international facility at some point. So you, much like the International Space Station, you may have a European module um, that shows up and has to connect in. So how it connects in is uh, very, very important. At gateway, there's much more of a focus on uh, don't have uh, really any EVAs or minimize the EVAs to the maximum extent possible. So there's a, a lot of effort going on with new types of batteries that could be ma uh, put inside the uh, module instead of the way ISS does it, which is outside the module, and trying to avoid the uh, ammonia-based cooling system, other things uh, like that. So I'd say uh, there is some sort of lessons learned from right. International Space Station on how to connect modules together. The, with the um, current launch vehicles, though, you know, you're going to end up with fairly small modules, and it's going to take, you know, multiple of them to... Right. Um, so, like, six or seven or more inter yeah. those standards for integrating 
right. systems, uh, right. communications, right. mechanical, right. Uh, fluid, et cetera. Yep. Okay. So, um, so the question. as far as the risks, um, you know, at the International Space Station and human spaceflight in general, they always talk about the top two risks are fire in, in space, the mirror comes to mind, and then also collision in space, also mirror comes to mind. So as someone who's been through a safety review panel, you know, you spend lots and lots of time on those uh, two topics. And that would be the same whether you're in cislunar space around the moon or around, um, you know, uh, low Earth orbit in the uh, ISS. Um, I do think that uh, the issue of radiation is not really quite as well characterized as in low Earth orbit. So there's, there's a whole series of unknown unknowns by moving to, in, uh, to lunar space associated with, you know, at the ISS, you can always get back to Earth really quickly, a matter of hours. You know, you're only, you know, uh, like 400 kilometers away to the surface and you can get back very quickly. From the moon, it's gonna be days on the fastest trajectory until you, until you get back. So uh, automation has uh, a lot more um, uh, aspects and basically how do you solve the problems yourselves on the, on the uh, lunar space station just takes a whole nother, uh, a whole nother angle and a whole, whole nother level of importance. Okay, thanks Bob. Uh, Susie, in your master's thesis, uh, you defined a 400 person facility, but what influenced New Venice the most in your thinking for your infrastructure and industrial architecture? Um, I think, it was mostly uh, understanding the the functionality of of the the outpost and what the different um, industries and activities would require, mm -hmm. and um, trying to create uh, the the necessary infrastructure that would serve each of these activities adequately. Um, I, I, I have done a lot of work um, on Earth with uh, industrial power plants and also um, subway stations and, and, and things like that. So I, I understand that function, I mean form follows function and in space where everything is extremely expensive, that is an even that's even more true. Mm -hmm. So you can't have waste of space and um, you can't have waste of resources. You can't have different um, industries, um, different activities interfering with each other. So yeah, I think just a, a deep analysis of the functionality and um, the needs of each activities is what influenced most. Okay, thank you. Uh, Fred, in your book, Space Settlements, as you were doing your research, uh, wh what did you like and not like about what you learned about the settlements? Well, uh, my, my other, I, I already told one of my favorite stories about the agricultural areas and the public space, but I think related to that, one of the, one of the things that, that was surprising in um, the way the project was presented to different audiences, and one of the, one of the things that Gerard O'Neill was, was very, very good at was speaking different languages to different audiences, speaking before Congress, of course, and speaking in popular science books. Right. He's, he's writing and, and talking against some of, the, um, some of the, the fears and anxiety surrounding ecology from the 1960s and 70s. And he's, he's sort of calling out some things, but not naming them by name. And I think the, the Club of Rome's limits to growth right. work is, is definitely an undercurrent that's haunting O'Neill's work. But also Rachel Carson's work um, in the uh, early 1960s with um, Silent Spring. Okay. It's the first time the idea that you know you could that that messing with something as complicated as an ecosystem was going to reveal a lot of unknown unknowns. Right. And that I, I was disappointed that 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 work was sort of invoked. He's he's talking about in the High Frontier um, how. 
there wouldn't need to be pesticides in these environments because we'd never introduce any pests in the first place. <laughs> so, right, I mean, that, it's probably going to be more complicated than that. But that's a direct, and he's talking about endangered birds. So there's no mention of, of Rachel Carson by name, but there's the invocation of her work and the kind of, just to sort of dismiss it and set it, set it aside, um, which I thought was a little bit abrupt, and it, you know, especially knowing what we now know about even more complications that are involved with ecosystem design, which isn't even a fully formed science. So that was, that was one thing, one other thing that was surprising. Um, one of the things I liked a lot, and it sort of became the thesis of the book, is that, um, the, is that the production of these images, to talk about these, these separate cultures and, um, and the, uh, even the way a capsule space station can, can take advantage of, the, of, of that um, quarantine to keep unsafe activities separate. These, these separate disciplines that come together to design these big scale projects, they're linked by the paintings. They're really, you know, I, I think again, just like O'Neill's ability to, to say, to use different kinds of language for different audiences, the paintings use the same language that all audiences can really understand and relate to. And I think it's related to the, to the way these artists have such diverse backgrounds in science fiction, illustration, planetary science, video game illustration. Uh, graphic design, et cetera. They, they really bring the cultures back together, which I thought was great. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dallas? Yes. Just a suggestion. Some of these people have been standing for quite a while. Maybe yep. we can let them ask some questions for it. We, we, yeah, so yeah, we can get to it. <laughs> Let's start here. <clears throat> so I had a question for you, Al. Um, in your space radiation uh, with shielding numbers, I noticed there was sort of a linear decrease. The more shielding you had, the more uh, radiation was reduced. But It's nonlinear. Yeah, that's what I heard. And what I heard actually, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you're more of an expert than I am on this, but if you add a little bit of shielding, you actually make matters worse for the humans that are shielded. And you have to add a lot before you actually get to the point where you're starting to make a benefit from just being exposed to person. That can happen. What it's referring to is if you have a little bit of shielding and a particle comes through and hits a, hits a nucleus, you will create a shower of secondary particles which can be more damaging than things. Now, if you look at the numbers um, uh, for deep space shielding, in, in my paper, you'll see that as you add a little bit of shielding, it immediately goes down, except a little bit of shielding in this case is a ton per square meter. Okay. okay. And, um, and, uh, and then the, and there's, there's, a, there's a, a second thing, and it's been a little while since I looked at it, but basically uh, you can see as you add shielding that um, at first the amount of radiation goes down, and then it comes up. Okay, and this is doing exactly what you're talking about. It never gets all the way back to zero shielding. But I, I didn't look at, at the, the space in the, in the parameter space just above zero. It's, it's a little bit of a jump. So yeah, you don't want to, uh, but, but when you get to the five, seven, you know, the seven tons per square meter, which you need for water and polyethylene in deep space, um, it's just, it, that, that effect is over. The secondary particles are mostly getting absorbed. All right, so, so, so your data does show that, yes. that interesting effect. Yeah. I didn't see it in your in slide. And I want one more small question, which was, can you just briefly explain to everybody what the South, Anam South Atlantic anomaly is and what, what's, what oh, it's caused the by? South, uh, uh, South Atlantic anomaly is a region of space above the South Atlantic and South America where radiation levels are significantly higher than uh, elsewhere in lower, so lower Earth orbit. And when I say significant, I mean a factor up to 500 or so. And so why? Why does that happen? Um, it has to do with complex motions in the in the uh, in the um, liquid core of of the Earth, and in a, a paper that I wrote on uh, stuff that we needed to do in order to make settlement work, uh, part of it is is make sure the South Atlantic anomaly doesn't move too much. <laughs> I put in a sentence that somebody else wrote that explained it, and I could I could tell that it probably explained it, and it probably explained it pretty well. I had no idea what they were talking about. Okay. Something about shifting parameters and reversing flow and uh, you know vectors of this and stuff like this. Like, I have no idea. What these guys, these guys are talking about it. It might take me months to go through the math. So I was going to trust them. Thank you. Okay. Let's go over here to my left, Jim. Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, Al a question, and that is about radiation too. Um, every time I hear your concept, I like it better and better. I mean, I think you've really done the homework to look at the sweet spot in terms of orbit that minimizes radiation exposure. But as you know, the magnetic field can change shape, and it can change shape very quickly under the stress of a, of a solar flare, massive solar flare. Last week was the 160th anniversary of the Carrington event 
of 1859. And uh, as most of you may know, in 2012, there was a huge solar superstorm that had it occurred a week earlier, Earth would have taken a direct hit. So you're going to have to have radi some kind of radiation protection if for no other reason than people in Oklahoma have to have tornado shelters. Okay, mm -hmm. They're not always at risk, but they're at risk sometimes and under certain conditions. So if you've done any thinking about the magnitude of protection you would need in a, in a radiation shelter. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you, you probably want to deal with this uh, with shelters, probably. Um, my favorite shelter is, um, if you read in, in some of O'Neill's work, the idea of a circular swimming pool. So uh, it's, this is a, a, a basically a torus wrapped around the axis of rotation so that you can dive straight up, among other things. And of course, it gives you a lot of water. And that might be uh, a good thing, dual use. So it's a swimming pool most of the time. And then when you get a, a radiation event, everybody goes there and hangs out for as long as it takes, which can be days, by the way. Um, now, if, if you're stuck in this thing, you're not actually stuck in it because every time you pass around the back side of the earth, you get, some, you get some shelter. And you can run out and get some more Oreos or whatever it is you happen to need. Um, now, I did some work using Alter Alteris will calculate um, uh, the effects of shielding on, on uh, solar storms. And I did some work um, to, to try to quantify that and to try to answer exactly the question you're talking about. How, how much mass do you need to stop a, a, a solar storm event? And um, it was a while ago, and I haven't looked at it, but I'm going, my memory is sort of coming back on it. And basically, I wasn't able to get enough data out of Alteris to answer the question. So I think it's still an open question. Uh, and it's, it's one that definitely uh, needs to have a good, hard look taken at it. Uh, but I don't have the tools right at the moment to do that. I'm, I may, as a result of this, I may uh, go back and redo some of those calcs and see if I can't see a, a, a way to answer the question properly. Well, kudos to you for your concept. I think you've approached it in an excellent fashion. Thanks. You have another question, but I'm happy to wait. Uh, this is to Bob Richards. Uh, I think it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that radiation exposure in deep space hasn't been characterized very well. It's, we've made a lot of progress in characterizing radiation exposure in deep space, and the problem is it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and so my worry, uh, having been at NASA for 22 years, is that this whole old excuse about, well, there are too many unknown unknowns is really a shield to keep from addressing the radiation problem anyway. And then I want to follow that with a question of a direct question. And is the reason that the gateway is only going to be manned for 60 days, isn't that because of the deep space radiation problem? And the reason I'm asking that is because we do six months in low Earth orbit, but the radiation exposure in deep space is three times that. So a 180-day exposure in low Earth orbit is pretty much similar to a 60-day exposure in deep space. I think you bring up all, all good points, and I'm certainly not uh, you know, an expert on uh, radiation. It is my understanding from uh, talking with NASA that they did pick the period of time, which kind of goes between, I've heard, two weeks, 60 days, you know, somewhere out there. But the gateway is not going to be continuously manned anytime soon, in part because they wanted to uh, collect additional information on radiation now. You're also right, they're not actually as much collecting the uh, data on the radiation itself, but the effect on humans. And that's where you get into things like uh, experiments with mice and genomic types of experiments and things like that. They're very, very uh, difficult to run, it takes a long time to get uh, results, and I think um, even with the results, you, you, I'm sure a lot of people will be scratching their heads saying, well, what is the effect? Well, but every time we do a, an experiment with mice, we learn that radiation is worse than we thought before. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so my worry is that we'll stop doing experiments on animals, on mammals, because we really don't want to know the answer. Right, right. So you, you bring up uh, a, lot of, a lot of good points. Of course, uh, to me, it's also reason to, you know, look at the lunar surface because if you're on the surface, then you've got a lot more shielding material. You, you know, you can hurry under the the surface and uh, and be sh assured of having a really 
strong radiation shield. And, and I appreciate your non-politician answer. You've been very forthcoming. All right. Thank you. Hey, Jim, Jim my, my understanding from, from for Gateway being only occupied as little as it is, is it relates to the SLS Orion capability to support people and that we're only building one SLS a year, which gets us one month or less out of the year. And I, I agree with you, Dallas, yeah. but I think it's a nice conversion of convenient answers <laughs> to describe yeah. why, are, why are we building a facility out there in which we're only going to have right. manned 20% of the time? Yeah, and hopefully we'll have Does experiments really running sense. when it's unoccupied as well. Well, no, that's not really true because my understanding is it's not going to be pressurized. I mean, it'll stay pressurized, but it'll leak. Yeah. When, it's, when it's uncrewed. So that means you won't be able to do automated science during the time that you don't have a crew there. That I wasn't so aware of. So that time is wasted. Yeah, you're right. Well, and also it depends on uh, what type of experiments you want to do. You know, I've seen a lot of interest on sort of fundamental physics type stuff, things that would be done actually in the vacuum, so in, independent of the... No, but I'm a life scientist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you want to live, right? Well, exactly. And if it's not pressurized, if you don't maintain the environment, you can't do automated life science research, yep. period. Right. Yep. yep. Good point. Yes. Uh, glad that all of you are in this area. Uh, unfortunately, I don't. I'm at T-Mobile, and you're going, huh? <laughs> what I do is I work with partnerships with robots, autonomous vehicles, and drones. And what I look for is value chain and supply chain. And I'm curious, when you're building each infrastructure, do you always have to consider launches because we had planetary resources? Unfortunately, they were slightly disbanded. But could you start looking into that using the robotics, using the materials that are out of space because we don't want to bring them back to the planet, at least politically we don't. And it would disturb our um, economic system. But have you looked at what are the areas that you need filled so you can continue this stream forward? Uh, launches seem to be rather expensive and dangerous. Is the question for? Who wants to? Yeah. Anyone who wants to answer, because all of you are trying to get space settlements. Yeah. Where are the areas that entrepreneurs like us could fill in to well, help well, this you, stream move forward? If you forward. go back to the original, you know, summer study in, in '75, you know, they were looking to get like 98 percent of the mass from the moon. So they were they were really trying to minimize the amount of stuff that you would bring up from the Earth. Mm -hmm. But to do that, they they were hypothesizing a fully reusable two-staged orbit vehicle and significant, you know, lunar infrastructure, including a mass driver, you know, to launch stuff back to, to, to Earth orbit and, and stuff like that. So to, to get it out into space. So, I mean, people have been looking at this for a long time. It's only now, in my opinion, that we're really getting serious about ISRU and Phil Metzger, I'm sure we'll have more comments on, on, on this, but, but the, um, but, but the, we're now just to the point where we have orbital data of, of from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and the international um, folks that have been orbiting the moon, but we have darn little surface truth data, especially at the poles. We have the L-cross data that we know that there's water and stuff like that, but actually what state this is, how easy is it is to get to this stuff, how do you beneficiate it, and then what infrastructure is it gonna take to do that? Those are all questions that hopefully within the next five years we're gonna get, but we we don't have answers right now. The the use of the use uh, having an entrepreneurial company go out and um, uh, mine the moon or the asteroids and deliver product to customer is premature at this point, I believe, and that's why DSI and planetary resources went under, is because their basic the basic uh, idea was well, premature. We're not we're really not ready. I had an opportunity to join DSI when it started. I didn't take it because I could not look a customer in the eye and tell him uh, an investor in the eye and tell him or her that uh, they were had much chance at all of making any money. I'm not talking about, you know, only 1%. I'm going to you know, a, a tenth of a, a hundredth of a, a, a thousandth of a percent or something like that. The problem is that your customers are on earth. Um, there's 7 billion customers on earth. There are six customers in space. So um, you either have to sell to those six, which is not much of a market, or you have to figure out how to compete with, uh, with materials with an entire planet. It's hard to do, and we're not ready. Uh, my feeling is this, is this is an area that should be uh, vigorous uh, government research, and maybe some, you know, maybe some startups should start. And, and, you know, they know they're going to probably go under, but they want to do it, and it's going to be fun, and they'll have a good time, and so they do it anyways. 
And it's perfectly reasonable. I'd like to chime in on this one. Um, space construction could change that whole dynamic. If you start building lots of things in space, yes. now you could start using these resources. We're just not there yet, though. There's no mining out there getting us structural metals. So, you know, once that starts to happen, yeah, they have a marketplace built in if we're building things in space. Uh, I'd like to also say that, uh, that this, this logic here of beginning to make an economic engine in space, I think, is uh, something that we were thinking about when we, when we did this research. If you can have a small habitat that can fill a useful function in terms of research or whatever it is, and then can also slowly grow, it can support the mining activities and the mining activities and support the habitat, and then you get something that starts to go around. And it doesn't have to be done at a large scale, it can be done at a small scale to begin with. And, and Anthony, what you shared about Transaster and their, their asteroid mining concepts, that's been funded by, by NIAC in the past. And, and so there's people looking into it, and, but, but like we've said, who, who's the customer at the moment? And, and how do they sell their product once they bring it back? But, but we have people here who would want to use it, exactly. Customers. Exactly, yes. exactly. So it's, it's coming, but, I, but, but we have yet to see it start. One other thing I want to say, because I happen to know about this, is a company called Momentus Space out there, and they are, they seem to be going somewhere, and they are basically planning to offer a kind of space tug capability to raise spacecraft to higher orbits or take them further away, using water as propellant. Right. And I think that's an indication of how this, the space economy may begin to diversify there and, and build. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go over to the left. Yeah, um, about three decades back in one of the events of this kind, uh, a Boeing executive named Gordon Woodcock, who led a lot of space studies, uh, various kinds, was asked what he thought was the most difficult challenge to building a space settlement. And he stared up at the ceiling for a minute and he looked at the audience for a minute and he said, well, there's a lot of things we don't really know how to do yet, but the most challenging is probably welding a large pressure vessel in orbit. <laughs> how do we build something sizable that will hold pressure? He says, we have no experience doing that. I don't even know how to start solving that problem. Yeah. I've been waiting for three decades for somebody to tackle that one or at least give uh, uh, an indication that we can solve it. Does anyone have any comments or ideas? Well, actually, I do have an, uh, a sort of a kind of response, which is that in the idea that, that I was presenting, the pressure hull is actually flexible. It's made of uh, probably UHMW or, you know, some comparably transparent and flexible material, and it's crucial that it be flexible for the growth process. But that, I think, you know, particularly with you add in NASA's soft technology, uh, then you begin to have an answer to that. A few years ago, I remember seeing an article, uh, the Lockheed Project, and they were uh, building relatively small titanium uh, pressure tanks. So these are very high pressure systems, right? And um, and it was being done in a vacuum with an electron gun. And it, it was a, a 3D printing kind of a thing, you know. And uh, they mentioned somewhere in that, in that article, it says something about the limiting, the size, the, the, the size is limited by the vacuum chamber. Well, you got a pretty good vacuum chamber in Leo. Yep. And friction stir welding may play a role there too because it, it doesn't use any gases or anything. It just kind of melts, melts the material together uh, with a friction process. So that's another thing that might work in space. Well, no, uh, tooling I think, would be. I think additive manufacturing, especially if yeah. you could use, you know, space resources, I think that is right. the nirvana if we, could, if we could, you know, do that. If you can put those two technologies together, you mine the stuff in space and then, you know, use additive manufacturing or or 3D printing to, uh, to, to start making some of this stuff. Um, I think right. that, that would be uh, an ideal uh, marriage. We have a video uh, showing uh, space construction of the Gateway Spaceport, creating uh, pressurized volumes in space. Mm -hmm. So if you ever wanted to have a chance to look at that, using uh, modular construction to put together pieces and, and put it all together. There have been patents on you know, thin metal vapor deposition in space, electron beam epitaxy in space, and so on and so forth. Right. No one's taken any steps to actually demonstrate their feasibility. Mm -hmm. No yeah. patents have been granted. That's not persuasive. I should add, by the way, a footnote to what I said, which is the idea of flexible yeah. containment only works if you have a shield on the outside. 
yeah. which we did, of course. But. Yeah. Okay, over here on the right. Hi. So um, I was. I have a question on to everyone who has a rotating space station planned. Um, so going. Th I did some quick hand calcs. Um, I used your numbers since I believe you were the only one who provided uh, the firm dimensions. Um, but if you have a 56 meter outer diameter to a space station, and we're assuming that the human is about two meters tall, so that's the caveat, um, you have about three to four percent acceleration difference from your feet to your head, and that means that the blood will drain down to your feet. Um, so my question is, has anyone heard of uh, any studies on this? And this may potentially be a hurdle for smaller space stations or rotating uh, habitats, if you will. Um, so the question is, do you have any information on this? And if so, how would you tackle it? Uh, I think you meant 56 meter radius. Yeah. You're talking about four RPM, right? Yes, right. at four RPMs. So the question's about Joe, you've looked gravity. into this, haven't you? The, the difference between the feet and the head? It, it's, the, the main problem is... Would you come use the mic, the Joe? Yeah. Joe, would you come use the mic? doesn't have to, um, you know, if it's varying by 3 or 4%, the, the main problem is the 100%. Right. Okay? And we want that. Uh, now, want in, in, there's been a lot of rotating room studies and there has been, and there's a, there's, a, there's a big long arm centrifuge at NASA Ames Research Center where, where people, the people are in it are in it, uh, can be put inside it in a way that mimics the geometry of um, a, rotating, a rotating settlement. In other words, your feet are pointed outward and your head is, towards, is headed, aimed at the axis of rotation. And they have done studies there um, uh, with, with people. Um, it's a much smaller arm than 56 meters, so it, the problem should be much, much worse. Um, but I haven't talked to the people who've done those studies to find out what the results, what the results were, because they were usually looking at different things. Uh, but I know that they have done studies and the people seem to have been okay, but I can't give you a really good answer, sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry? Mm -hmm. I don't. Right. Get on the microphone. I'm the one that tells everyone to use the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Peter Diamandis is a SSI senior associate from a long time at Harvard and MIT, and he wrote a paper in 1987 that was at a, an SSI um, gathering. Uh, you may want to look. It's on SSI.org. Just look, look up Coriolis effect. Okay, I'm looking at it right now. It's Reconsidering Artificial Gravity for 21st Century Space Habitats, Habitats by SSI Senior Associate Peter Diamandis. Uh, he was also involved a little bit in X Prize and things like that. But, um, but you may want to start there, okay? Because any, any artificial gravity stuff being done on, on vertebrates on a planetary surface, a lunar surface, Martian surface, is not going to help you very much. It has to be free space. And so that's what this, that's what this uh, article, that's what this paper has to do mm -hmm. with, okay? Because, you know what I mean? Has to be done in free space. So this is actually the best place to start. Reconsidering artificial gravity for 21st century habitats um, by SSI Peter Diamandis, okay? Thank you. Thanks. On, over here on the right again. So the first thing I'm going to do when I go home is look at that because my question's very closely related. Um, if you go back to the NASA Ames study, there was a lot of talk about having to have a habitat where we only turn one RPM. And some of what you people are discussing is much more than that. And part of the reasoning, I believe, was they were worried about people going EVA, going to, to zero gravity outside of the space station and back at higher RPMs. Uh, my background's medicine, not engineering, but I have trouble picturing how we do the science to figure out what really is safe. And if we're turning at four RPM, can we do that and go outside? If you, if you take a look at the papers, um, 
uh, that put in people in rotating rooms and they went from zero to 10 RPM. Um, there was one person involved in the study, or two, or two or three people in the study, that constantly went in and out of the room. And those are the graduate students that deliver the food. Okay, so so although it wasn't, it, so it was not a part of the official study exactly what they're studying. In fact, they did get a lot of not data, but a lot of experience with people going in and out of in and out of a rotating environment. And as far as they could, they, they weren't looking for problems, but they didn't they didn't see any problems. There's, there's, there's an experiment that most people don't know about that I think Diamandis was involved in. This is actually really quite important with rotation. What they did is they took some the Skylab astronauts, eight of the nine Skylab astronauts, and they, they, they on the ground they sat them and they, they ramped up um, to I think uh, 10 RPM in steps, and at each step they would they would make them do head motions, which is sadistic, okay? <laughs> because I mean it really make if they all got filthy sick and just barfed their guts out, okay? And so they went up into space, and they, ran the, they waited until they were adapted. They didn't do it when they first got up there. And they put them in the chair, and they did the exact same sequence, and there were very minor effects. Most of the astronauts had no effects, and one or two had very mild st stomach discomfort. Then they came back down onto Earth, did it again, got filthy sick. Okay. So it's only one experiment. It's only eight people, you know, <laughs> buy or be warned. It is possible that rotation will not be much of an issue at all, okay? And the reason that this is, I think, this is just a hypothesis, is that what's going on is your brain is looking out and seeing one thing, and the otolith's telling him something else, and it can't make everything work, and so it figures, maybe I ate something, let's throw up, okay? <laughs> now, on Earth, uh, you have a complicated vector field force field, but you're, you're rotating, at the same time you're being pulled down by gravity. Mm -hmm. In Space Lab, Skylab, uh, you're in free fall and all you have is a rotation, that makes it easier for the brain to figure out what's going up and reduces the necessity to upchuck. Mm -hmm. Just a hypothesis, but it fits the data and it, it's a really, we should re repeat these, these studies because it's really going to make everything really kind of easy if it turns out it's just not much of a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Here on the left. Yeah, my name is John Charles, retired from NASA after almost 33 years as a civil servant doing life sciences research. So that makes me kind of a minority, I think, in this group, uh, along with Jim Logan and also my colleague Erica Wagner here. Uh, just a couple of comments on, on what uh, Al just said. Uh, that all would be very interesting and very nice and very relevant if only we had a duplicate of the space flight case where you have the, the gravity, the acceleration going head to foot instead of at an angle through your head at slight angle and you got, you know, even the rotating room at Ames that you described has only been used occasionally and intermittently and there'd be a whole lot more uh, value to all of our hypothesizing if we had some actual data to base it on. Sadly, we don't. As a current, changing topic sl slightly, the, the question about uh, the three or four percent gravity gradient from head to foot uh, sort of falls into the category of, Doc, it hurts when I do this, well then don't do that. <laughs> uh, if you feel yourself getting lightheaded at uh, a gravity gradient of three or four percent, or even at a gravity gradient of zero percent, which is what I'm feeling right now, tighten up your leg muscles, sit down, lay down, wear a G-suit. There's at least seven countermeasures to orthostatic intolerance I can give you right now to solve that problem. So uh, that problem is not so much insurmountable. Even the 100% gravity gradient, as uh, we're talking about going in a, a two-meter radius, and by the way, I am a two-meter person, so if you want to know what a two-meter <laughs> radius looks like, this is it. I have zero G at the head and one G at the foot, or, or zero G at the head and two Gs at the foot would be even more dramatic. There's ways to protect you if you think that's a good idea. I don't think that's necessarily a good idea, but we can protect you if you want to do that. Thank you. Mark. Well, uh, anybody doesn't know, I'm CEO Emeritus of the National Space Society. Um, and since it's close to lunch, I have a deep think question for everybody, anybody. Um, Let's run, say, a thousand years in the future. Question is, uh, will civilization become easier and easier to do in space as compared to a planetary surface like Earth, or not? Uh, in other words, where the long-run economics of the situation push you more and more into space 
as compared to being on a planetary surface like Earth, or maybe the opposite. So what do people think? So, so where will economics drive us? In space cities or surface cities? Yeah. Or civilization as a whole? Space. <laughs> you have right. to give a reason. I, I, think oh. the original, I think the original kind of um, thing, question that O'Neill asked, and, you know, Jeff Bezos has, has kind of come to the same conclusion that, you know, that there's a lot of things that, um, you know, pollution, you know, climate change, all the things that we're worried about here when you're trying to do really nasty, messy stuff in a closed environmental system mm. are much easier if you go off into space and, and you, can, you can do these things. So um, I think that, uh, that the, the logic of this now, there's a lot of logical things that turn out to not work out so well um, and that we don't do as humans. But um, I think that that and there's certain of this stuff that uh, you need to go try it. I mean, a lot of things are great in theory. You know, one of my favorite sayings is in, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. So you know, <laughs> we, need, we need to go get that practice. We need that, the, the, the actual experience of, of doing these things um, and not just, you know, convincing ourselves with thought exercises that, that the world is going to be great. John? The reason I chose space uh, was because it's much cheaper to get to low Earth orbit than it is to go to the moon. Uh, I think the list factors are five to one or something like that. So we're going to be doing a lot in low Earth orbit for, I believe, generations. And the people of the future, when they look in the sky, it's going to be very different from what we see right now. There's going to be a lot of points of light floating overhead. Like I said earlier, it's going to be cities, it's going to be factories, it's going to be farms. There's going to be a lot going up there. I think, uh, let me rephrase the question a little bit. What is the crossover point in terms of population between there's more people living in space than on Earth? And, and, and well, first of all, we'd like to hope that there's a crossover space because someday Earth is going to become uninhabitable. It's going to either leave the habitable zone or the sun's going to go red giant. And, and maybe we'll learn how to deal with that by then. But that, that seems pretty tough. And I think that. I just get feeling is a thousand years isn't, isn't enough to produce, you know, five or ten billion people in space. Uh, but I could easily be wrong. I, I think one of, one of my favorite uh, things about the, this sort of big culture question of the 1970s is that we've kind of forgotten one, one sidebar discovery that's mentioned in High Frontier and elsewhere, which is that there's, there's going to be thermal pollution no matter what we use as an energy source on Earth, that, um, that doing useful work creates heat as waste no matter what. And there were even some SETI scientists at the time. Sebastian von Horner was proposing you look for anomalous heat sources, and that's how you find another expanding technological civilization. So the, the question is really a question of, of larger social philosophy. Is expansionism the problem, not planetary surfaces. And even if we leave a planetary surface as a civilization, we're going to run up against some hard limit in the solar system and then et cetera, et cetera. Go to the next star. But I think that that logic of expansionism has to be questioned at some point, which was also built into the Club of Rome mm. uh, work. And you know, even, even if we followed the uh, O'Neill paradigm of building giant solar uh, power satellites and beaming uh, microwaves back to Earth, that's going to create waste heat in the atmosphere like crazy. It, it's, it's trivial. I've, I've seen... I've done the calculations. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's I, trivial I, amount. The, the real problem is, the, is compared, compared to car, you know, CO2 and so forth, it's quite trivial. But I would like to, to get in on this expansion. Of course yeah. we're into expansion. We're alive. <laughs> Have you ever seen a species that would not expand as far as it can that has been successful? And think about the species that go, I'm going to be... I'm so optimized for this lake in Oregon. I really know how to operate in this lake for Oregon. I'm not going to go anywhere. You're in mortal danger. Uh, not, no, because we have to save the lake to save There's, the species. Yeah, because something will come. Yeah, so, something's going to come along, and that lake's going to go kaplooey, and then that's the end of your species. Now, that is not who we are. We are the only species that can get us off planet to do that kind of expansion. Nobody's even close. The dolphins are great. They're probably smarter than us. They can't build rockets. Do we, do we take the lake critters with us? Absolutely, we have to. We couldn't possibly survive without them. 
You know, on that idea of uh, the crossover that Al mentions here, um, I think aviation may be a good model for that. Uh, Wright Brothers took off in uh, 1906, and just last year, four billion people traveled around the planet. So it may happen sooner than you think. Yep. There was a question on the there left. A, there was a diplomat, addressing Mark's excellent question, there was a diplomat named Louis Halley who wrote an article in Foreign Affairs Magazine, of all things, uh, 1980, and it's called A Hopeful Future for Mankind. And he looked at the human prospect, and he says, well, we might not blow ourselves up. We might not die in climate change. You know, we might not be destroyed by a bio biological plague, whether it's human-created or natural. We might not be hit by an asteroid, you know. But on the other hand, if you look far enough in the future, at least one of these things is bound to happen, or something else, Vulcan you know, volcanology destroys the world. Just, if there is a hopeful future man for mankind, it's not on a planetary surface, because sooner or later they stop being habitable. Very elementary and beautifully done. Yeah, em embarking on that, um, I I'd like to say that once we master the art of living um, outside of a planetary surface, we can virtually go anywhere that our ships can take us. Um, but if we decide to settle other planets, then there's always going to be new things that we have to consider. But as long as we are in space and not on a surface, once we master it, we can do it anywhere. I would like to say that I think that I, I agree with, um, with Al and, and several of the other speakers, and also with O'Neill, that, that if we learn how to live well in space, and I think that that means building naturalistic environments that we enjoy, like we enjoy Earth, then the, the planet has a chance of recovering from us. And then maybe it'd be a fun place to visit, and we wouldn't be screwing with it, Perfect. you know. And you could, everybody could spend maybe two thirds of the time in space and visit Earth for a third of the time, or a fifth of the time, whatever it is. And we could have a sort of nomadic existence, which might Let be me really, throw really a fun. Corollary, a question in. Suppose this was a conference of environmentalists, <laughs> and there was a bunch of environmentalists up in the front of the room. I asked the same question. What do you think they would say? It would burn you at the stake. <laughs> I think that they would say, yeah, let's get off the planet, then the environment can recover. I think related to that, it's kind of the same question. If, if humans can, can crack that nut of ecosystem design, then we will be able to design and regulate, hopefully more sustainably, the ecosystem that we're embedded in right now on the planet. Yeah, I'm talking to an interesting uh, young woman in, in UCLA who's whose whole bag is, uh, she's an ecologist and a mathematician and a, a control theory uh, person, and she wants to learn how to control a small closed ecosystem. Mm. Good. Uh, that would be a really right. neat trick to have up our sleeves. Jim. Hey, thanks. Um, thanks for great presentations earlier, everyone. So I, <clears throat> yeah, I've noticed um, that one of the Apparent principles in technology development curves <clears throat> seems to be that from first, beyond first prototype to first sale of a item in the industrial sector, it takes about 20 to 40 years, a bit of a window, uh, for average adoption in, in the uh, marketplace. I've also noticed that when venture capitalists, particularly, get on a hype curve and they follow their sheepish behavior patterns, <laughs> invariably, uh, six to 10 years into that hype curve, the bottom falls out of it and they all go, well, what do you know? We're way too early for this. And what happens is in that expansion of a new sector growth curve, after that eight to 10 year collapse, there's then consolidation um, some buyouts and some, you know, chaff falls away. And, and then you get some products that, after that first 10 years, in that second 10 years, start to approach the, that average adoption, sector adoption. So there, there seem to be some um, observable historic data points that we can point to. Now, in the space sector, we have a, a, a bit of a problem of self-delusion, 
out of enthusiasm and passion and we want to see things happen while we're still breathing. And so we tend to project our objectives and goals to the end point. So my question, my question is, if our end point is space settlements, rotating space settlements, or, or whatever it may be in this context, are there uh, potential products in space or activities that we could undertake where we can maybe have a 10 and 20 year milestone, more or less, with that, because that's what the data seems to point to, and maybe we should interpret it in a different way rather than uh, time-based. But are there, are there stages that we could ad adapt that would then allow us to push forward that service and market and have customers that gain in investor enthusiasm look out and expect and even build in the collapse of sector confidence that will occur in that six to ten year period as that first stage uh, and then prepare for a consolidation so that in 15 to 20 years we could actually have some operating systems in space that might then be resistant to those market and investor forces. Uh, it may be a bit of a convoluted question. But very, very. Um, how do we rephrase that? So what is the first step that we can do that gets us somewhere that is both investable and serves the market and isn't subject to the overriding dominance of our enthusiasm to see the end goal before it's viable? If well, it I frightens could. me, but I think I understood what you said. <laughs> I have no idea, so. <laughs> so somebody wanted? Yeah, I was Go going ahead. to say that, that the perspective that you're raising is really what is driving what we have been trying to do in terms of producing a global um, habitat that doesn't have to be a particular size. It can be whatever size you can handle at that time. So it then becomes, it's not the thing that's driving everything, it's responding to whatever's going on. If you can do that, then I think maybe you'll have a, a system that's sufficiently flexible to, to handle the bumps of the ride. And as, as, as uh, session chair, I would say, in a lot of the presentations you saw today, you saw a lot of similar type module appearances or constructs, and that may be the seed for everything we saw on the stage is a, a singular module that can be flown separately or integrated into a larger structure in a larger community. But I think there's a more fundamental thing. I think what Jim's getting at here is what do you, what do, you do first? How do you nucleate this thing? And, and one of the things that we tried to do with SpaceHab when we originally set it up, what we were trying to do is you were trying to do some science and other things. But what a lot of us were really focused on was, was you know, manufacturing in space. Can you take something from the Earth? Can you take it into space? Can you do something to it that adds value? Can you bring it down and can you sell it for a profit? If you can do that, then that helps pay for the transportation. Once you get the more transportation, particularly reusable transportation, that brings the price down, then that opens up all kinds of things. I think, to your point, after the 35 years that it's been, I think we are on the cusp of doing that now. I think you're going to see in the next three to five years that people are able to do things in space, bring them back down, sell them, make a profit, um, and that I think that's the economic um, sustainability that you really need. Because the question we're not asking that I think is really fundamental here is, is the why are we going into space? Are we going into space just because we all want to go live in space or yes. whatever? I think the question here is, is what are you going to do in space that pays for you to stay in space? You know, that's where O'Neill came up with those space solar power. That may or may not be the answer. But I think that one is going to be, two is the economics of it. And I think the other one is going to be the quality of life. If you have a really cool quality of life, but, you know, who wants to go into space to live in a, you know, a, a telephone booth, you know, sucking off an oxygen bottle in a hell hole, um, because that's all we can afford to put up there. If it's the, anywhere near the really pretty pictures that we saw in there, then I think a lot of people are gonna wanna go. So I think one is the economics, and I think two is the quality of life, that if people can see that they've got a better life in space, then they'll go. Yep. But it's gotta be nice. Don't even think about, about these dystopias because they're not gonna work, people just won't go. Yeah, that actually segues really in, into what I wanted to ask about. Uh, all these presentations uh, did a great job of talking about the technical side 
uh, and to some degree uh, touched on the biological aspect and the medical aspect. Then there's the psychological aspect, and uh, for all that we can't test some aspects of the biological aspect of the question, the psychological aspect is, is even more uh, convoluted and difficult to, to approach. So, for instance, light in a artificial uh, space settlement. Um, I looked at some of you that seem to approach it as coming from above, which, you know, uh, having thought about it a fair bit, I think that it's necessary for a human being to have a sense of there being a sky in their world. Uh, and the, the, the way you uh, space things out and uh, set up for people to interact with each other. But perhaps you could talk simply about the aspect of light. Uh, have you thought in your designs about how to approach the question of getting light that a human feels like they're comfortable in for long periods of time, feel relaxed in that kind of ambience? Well, first, recognize that different humans have much different light experiences. Um, people who live in the north, above the Arctic Circle, it's completely dark for six months. Yet people live there. It's not a selling point, mind you. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I, do not, I, I, mean, I think human beings are incredibly flexible and adaptable. And we can adapt to an awful lot. Okay. That said, you know, a nice lighting scheme can make a big difference in terms of desirability. And I think one of the big, the big things is O'Neill really wanted to have natural light, reflected sunlight coming into the, into the habitat. And the designs I've done have all assumed, if, you know, that's hard to do geometrically. And, and, the, and the designs you have probably don't work very well. Uh, these enormous panels that are, you know, sort of floating out in space by themselves, rotating at one RPM. Um, but I think there's a big, big problem is, is uh, if you go with all artificial light, you get much less intense light. I've never been under artificial lights except for these infrared lights that I could actually feel the heat. But anything that's like illuminating a football field or something like that, you, don't, you can't even feel the, feel the heat, heat at all. And f for agriculture, you know, it uses a lot of juice if you have to do it uh, manually. On the other hand, if you let the light in, you've got, this is just an engineering problem. Yeah. Yeah, if you let the light in, you got to get, the, then the heat's come with it. It's all going to turn, everything's going to turn into heat. You have to get rid of, you know, the stuff you use, the stuff you don't use. So I think this is a, you know, it's a really, really interesting area to be looking into, and I think it's some very serious issues. Don't have any solutions to them, though. Well, I, I do want to suggest uh, that those questions are <clears throat> Uh, what drove the, the shape of the design we ended up with is exactly that. Uh, whether it works, that's up to you guys to decide. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. One more. Oh, hi all, you are my name. Um, I'm a lifelong fan of uh, uh, O'Neill's vision, uh, but we've seen it mostly dormant for the last 50 years. Uh, but now it's, I think it's really time to uh, give it a reboot, sort of, and thank you to the organizers for, for the idea. Uh, well, and basically if, if uh, the missing link that uh, was between uh, O'Neill's uh, vision and the reality uh, are hopefully the, uh, the, well, is the ask end of the companies like uh, Blue Origin, SpaceX, uh, and mm -hmm. hopefully Relativity Space and Firefly and more. Um, um, my question would be like, um, what besides that, uh, besides the falling uh, launch costs, and obviously the improvements in telecommunication and uh, microelectronics, what other fields do you see as those that uh, improved, even though the dream was dormant, you know? What chapters of High Frontier should be rewritten besides just these two topics that I mentioned? Uh, farms. The, um, there is an enormous boom in indoor agriculture. Sometimes they call it vertical uh, uh, gardens, uh, farming. Um, but, but it all boils down to um, you, put, you put plants in, in an environment where you just give them everything they want. You give them the CO2 they want, the, the light they want, the dark they, they want, the, the frequencies of light that they want, and so forth and so on. And you get these enormous increases in productivity. Um, and by the way, you can get rid of the pests, not by not importing them. That's impossible. They'll come with you. Um, but the plants grow so fast that the pests can't keep up. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, 
And, and interestingly enough, uh, the, the leader in this is uh, the Netherlands. The Netherlands, believe it or not, the itsy bitsy teeny mini country is the second largest exporter of food in the world. Wow. The United States is the first. Now granted, a lot of that is it comes in a package and they go out. But they have just miles and miles of these very high-tech greenhouses where they adjust the lighting to be absolutely perfect. And it's just an amazing, you, you can produce enormous amounts of food. And, and this is all being worked out for free from our point of view, right? <laughs> Um, because you can, you can, uh, i just give you one example. You can buy a shipping container and you can plop it down in an empty lot in a city and plug in water and power and produce baby greens every day, rain or shine, snow or whatever, and deliver them to the restaurants in the neighborhood for their high expense, very expensive salads. There's a company called Freight Farms and they do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my question is for John. Um, I, I got the impression that um, the Von Braun station would be, um, well, it's, it seemed like Jeff Bezos was your primary um, way of funding program. So I'm wondering if you've got other, other um, plans. No, uh, Jeff Bezos was not really the, the primary funding <coughs> mechanism for uh, uh, Von Braun station. That was just for space construction because if he wants to build his factories in space, he's going to need that. So we're hoping he'd come in to, to talk with us about that. No, the funding mechanism for Von Braun Station is actually different. Um, we just completed a exhaustive financial analysis of what it would cost to build it and created models for what it would cost for people to go there and that kind of thing. Um, we haven't included the new information that I just talked about, um, a possibility of ice shielding, and electromagnetic shielding, but um, <clears throat> I guess we might as well come up with some numbers since maybe people are familiar with it. Uh, we're looking at about $70 billion to build a station. And the reason this is so low, uh, half the cost of ISS, is because ISS is bespoke. Everything is, you know, and NASA too, which is always overpriced. Uh, we use models from the aircraft industry to build things because the modules are all the same. The couplings are all the same. The access tubes are all the same. And <clears throat> The primary design philosophy for Von Run Station was always simplicity and affordability. We weren't trying to do anything exotic. I mean, there's really good designs out there, but this one is just simple in every way we could go. We dealt with uh, existing contractors for systems. We dealt with existing contractors for ERV vehicles, all of that. Um, the people who is going to finance it, that's another thing that we want to establish as something new that needs to be done for the entire space industry. We need to show, we need to bring in traditional investors that would invest in other things into this sector so that things can be built. The biggest challenge for all of us in this room to have our dreams come true is not engineering. We've got brilliant engineers here. It's economic. So that's what we're going at right at, we're, from the gate, is we're going after the uh, economic model to make it affordable. So John, for clarity, did you say 70 million with an M? I meant billion if I said 70 million. 70, 70 million? Billion, yes. B billion with a B. Yeah, billion. Okay. Okay, we're getting very close to our lunch break. Um, I do have one question uh, before we break. <laughs> uh, this is for Al, and I, I guess, um, Bruce, maybe for you also, since this sort of a space portal type thing, perhaps. Uh, you mentioned the rotating room at NASA Ames and how it hasn't really been used very much. Um, it seems to me if you have sort of that sort of facility, it it's obviously costs a lot more to build it than to run it. So what would it take to get that going again? Um, it, it's not actually a room, it's, but it's a, a long-arm centrifuge. Um, but it's not in a room, not, not like the Graybeal studies back in the 60s and 70s where they did have a, a rotating room. Um, I think that they have, been, they are, they have uh, my sister is a biologist at Ames, and she, she studies rodents and gravitational effects on rodents. And I think, and you may know more about this than I, that over the last couple of years they've tried to refurbish it they, because they want to do um, some studies of variable gravity. Uh, but I don't really know too much about it. Um, but I believe they're actually uh, preparing it for use and starting to use it for stuff again. And, and what it takes is you need to, to find somebody on the NASA side who's interested in the topic there and, and then, you know, do some kind of a Space Act agreement to, uh, to, to do that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, I, don't know, I know Lee Stone works over there, so I don't mm -hmm. know who else works in the, in the centrifuge area, but there are some people there 
Um, I was over there last year and it looked like it, they were still using it at least occasionally. So, um, so I would say if somebody's interested in using it, you know, um, reach out to me and I'll put you in touch with the right people. All right. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists and I'd like to thank Dallas. Uh, we're going to adjourn now for lunch. So on that note, let's thank our speakers. Thank you.